pray. Gracious and eternal God, the hour has come and now is that they that worship thee must worship thee in truth and spirit. And they got a few people from various parts of this city have assembled under the sound of my voice to hear a word from thee. Help me to decrease and that thou us may increase. Arrest someone who is traveling down the wrong highway of life. Arrest someone who's going too fast and those who are moving too slow and procrastinating and are slothful. And dear God, help us to realize that it's not my brother, my sister, my mother, my father that stands in the need of prayer, but dear God, it's me who stands in the need of prayer. Help us to receive the engrafted word. We rebuke Satan now from any distractions about worldly affairs, of things we would do after we leave here, but focus intently on this moment. For this moment is the only moment we have and let, we get, let us give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Christ Jesus' name we pray, the people of God said, Amen. Amen. There's a word from the Lord as we share with you a sermon series thought, Authentic Christianity, that the Lord put on my heart. Authentic Christianity, part one, returning our love. And the text is taken from Second. Corinthians, <clears throat> the sixth chapter, beginning with verse 11 through 13, and it reads, Thusly, we have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our affections, but only in yours. In return, I speak as to children, open wide your hearts also. And from the message translation reads thus, dear, dear Corinthians, I can't tell you how much I long for you to enter this wide open spacious life. We didn't fence you in. The smallness you feel comes from within you. Your lives aren't small, but you're living them in a small way. I'm speaking as plainly as I can and with great affection. Open up your lives. Live openly and expansively. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his holy word. <clears throat> the book of 2 Corinthians is regarded by some as the most neglected, unknown, or even ignored major writings of the New Testament. Because of this, an emphasis on its contents proves beneficial. In our today's text, Paul bared his heart and revealed his personal thoughts more than any of his other writings. The issues with which he dealt required a sincere, genuine revelation about his real self. The occasion of the letter was a resurgence of antagonism to Paul's apostolic authority, and its purpose was the vindication by Paul of that authority. Paul is writing to a church in conflict, a church divided by disputes regarding worship, lawsuits, spiritual gifts, leadership, and more. Paul's own leadership has been challenged and his credibility questioned. He feels injured by the divisions and the brokenheartedness by the fractured relationships. Still, he retains deep affections for the Corinthian church. He reaches out, not as one nursing a grudge, but as one holding firm to unconditional love, reflecting the love of Christ in which God, the injured party to human sin, reaches out to us. Paul invites the church to experience the expansive and spatial life of love by reopening their hearts to him and to the message of the gospel he proclaims. I recently read about an email a pastor received from a reader who was lamenting the tragic absence of love in the body of Christ. 
He was grieved by the failure of many to take seriously the words of John, who insisted that whoever loves God must also love his brother. The failure of the church to love its own is an ugly blemish on the public face of Christianity. All of us have seen it, and many of us have felt this pain. There are countless reasons why there is such a problem. Fear, lack of trust, suspicion, past failures, grudges, unforgiveness, anger, broken promises, most of which is fueled by pride and ambition and by greed and insecurity and gossip as well. Perhaps you should just fill in the blank. But for this, sadly, many people have left the church and many will never return. One of the many strengths of scripture is its refusal to sugarcoat the relational dysfunction among its more prominent characters. I suppose some might have preferred that Paul not publicize his struggles within the Corinthians. You know, like folks don't want to publicize their family business. You say, don't be telling nobody what's going on here. They didn't want Paul to tell about the family business and what was going on in the church. And they wonder why the Spirit preserved for us so many ungodly episodes. And I'm glad that he did. Because if he didn't, how else will we learn principles for conflict resolution? That's why I like the Bible so much, because it reflects people like you and I. Not perfect people, but imperfect people. Am I right about it? And you see, how else can we grow in relational harmony and overcome the many obstacles that hinder our witness to a lost and dying world unless we see up front what nastiness looks like and how to clean it up? That there was a palpable tension between them is evident from Paul's words. And although brief, we won't be long, close examination of this paragraph will yield great wisdom for resolving our interpersonal struggles in the body of Christ, which makes for authentic Christianity, which makes for keeping it real. Paul spoke and we read, we have spoken frankly to you. Our heart is wide open to you. There's no restrictions in our affections, but only in yours. In return, I speak as to children, open wide your hearts also. Paul loved these people at Corinth, and he manifested that love in various ways towards them. And he has demonstrated, as he says, by two special things. Here are two things that Paul says in this text. He says, our mouth is open to you, he says. Now, for most of us, that's not a good thing. Our mouths are open sometimes too much. Am I right about it? Amen. The wisdom book, especially Psalms and Proverbs, have much to say about the dangers of the tongue, as does James. There's wisdom in knowing when to keep silent, when not to answer. Jesus, when he was falsely accused, the scripture says, opened not his mouth. Some, I've learned this in marriage. Sometimes, <laughs> because I tell the young man, do you want to be right or do you want to be married? <laughs> and I discovered I want to be married. I know I I know I'm right, but I can't win that battle, so I just zip it up. I, I, I just don't say anything. Amen. Amen. Somebody know what I'm talking about. As some have taken Paul to be saying that he has said too much, but the context makes it clear that this is an expression of affection. Paul's mouth is wide open in the sense, catch this, that he will not withhold any good from them. As he said to the elders in Ephesus in Acts 20, 18, let me read this to you. He says, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plot of the Jews, and how I did not shrink 
from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable. He opened his mouth wide because it was profitable. But what comes out of our mouth can be corrosive or it can build up. Your words, what comes out of your mouth can give grace to those who hear. What you say can truly convey God's grace. Paul says our mouths are open to you. We're not holding nothing back that would be good for you. That means he communicated with them. He told them what was going on in his life. He shared with them his feelings, his struggles, his pressures, his failures, and his problems. He let them know how he coped with them. He opened up. He was vulnerable. And that, catch this, is always a mark of love. To open up to others is to love them. Conversely, to close up and not communicate is to violate love. Why do you think the top three reasons why people, particularly African Americans, get a divorce? We, know, we understand about the finance. We understand about the infidelity. But the third top reason why people get a divorce is a failure to communicate. Not to communicate is to violate love. I'm talking to somebody now because you're not communicating that well. <laughs> you say, preacher, how you know? Oh, preacher knows. <laughs> <laughs> you said you ain't been down my street. Yes, I have. <laughs> I was sitting in your backyard. I saw the, the problems there. But let me just say to you this one. This is a frequent problem in churches today. Christians, now I catch that, I want you to understand. Christians actually think, and I believe many here, some, not many, some here at Covenant, actually think that it is right for them to be closed in on themselves, to be private persons, unwilling to communicate who they are, how they are feeling and where they are in their lives. This coming January, the Lord willing, as the book of James says, I will have served this church with love for five years as your pastor. Amen. I ought to get amen. amen. That means I got along with you and you got along with me. <laughs> and we put up with each other. But there are still many care partners I know very little about who they are, how they feel, and where they are in their lives. If I have to officiate their funerals, as I have officiated funerals since I've been here, I will have to glean information about them from their loved ones, or call church members, or read what's printed in the obituary. This is unfortunate, and of course, is the way of the world. The world teaches us to let no one see who we are, including your pastor, in whom your souls have been entrusted. But we need to understand that when we become Christians, we must learn to open up to one another. Paul says, first, our mouth is open to you. And secondly, he says, our heart is wide. He says, he means there's no favoritism. He includes the whole congregation. He did not merely love the nice people among them. But he loved them all, the difficult ones, like David. Oh, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't say that. <laughs> that wasn't in my text. The difficult ones, the ones who were struggling, and the hard-to-get-along ones as well. There were no preconditions that he demanded before he could love somebody in the congregation either. He accepted them as people. Though he knew their struggles, their weaknesses, their heartaches, their failures, and their resistance, he loved them. And we, too, must love people regardless of their past, 
their mental health status, their socioeconomic status, their political affiliation, their racial or gender identity, sexual preference. We must love people. And I know this is hard for the church, but we are called to love. Yes. Can I get an amen? amen? Paul loved them regardless. Here's, here's what I want you to see. He loved them. And when you're called to pastor, you have to love people regardless. You, and I thank God that I love the members and the care partners of Covenant Community Church. I think he has given me a heart to love. The problem was that they did not love him in return. And this is the problem in the church. I want to understand that it's not just a problem in the church. I thought about this because it affects me as also. But this is a problem in churches, in individual lives, in homes, in families, and in marriages today. It's a failure to understand the reciprocal nature of love. Yes. Love is a two-way street. Yes. It always is. It is inherently so. Love, what you're saying, preacher, love requires a response. Yes. Paul was loving them, but they were not loving him back. They were closed. They were unresponsive. They were coldly self-contained within. As a result, Paul essentially says they were restricted in their own affections. The word translated affections is a Greek one in Greek, splanchna, referring to the inward parts, the viscera, the, or entrails, if you will. It is obviously a metaphor for the emotions or feelings of deep affections. Paul unashamedly declares that they have failed to reciprocate his love. His feelings for them are honest and sincere and passionate. He has not closed himself to their needs or their pain, but they in return have not returned the favor. If he is open, they are closed. They were limited. They were imprisoned within the narrow boundaries of their own selfish lives. That's why, again, listen to what the Message Bible says. I can't tell you how much I long for you to enter this wide open, spacious life. We didn't fence you in. The smallness you feel comes from within you. Your lives aren't small, but you're living them in a small way. I'm speaking as plainly as I can. He's been real with great affection. Open up your lives. Live openly and expansively. It saddens my heart deeply to know of church members and especially family members and friends who live selfish lives. Do you know anybody that lives selfish lives? As the text, well, it may be you before you start saying who you know about. Because if I ask some of your family members and co-workers, they said she's a selfish old thing. <laughs> Now, don't, yeah, I, I <laughs> so, so don't be putting your finger to me. You know some folks. You, you, you may have to put that mirror back on you. As the text says, hit this. Their lives aren't small, but they are living in a small way. What do you mean, preacher? They keep their hearts closed their hands closed. They don't give much, and they open their hands to get a lot, but they keep it closed in church and in family. And their mouths are closed. They won't fellowship with you or share and give generously or open their mouths to let you know how they are living. How do you live your life? Do you proactively make the most of your gifts and talents? Or do you bury them like the servant who was fearful and negligent? Do you seek out fulfilling experiences and relationships or make excuses like the lame man at the poolside of Bethesda? Or do you spend too much time looking back like Lot's wife? 
looking back on old hurts and pain? Are you giving yourself the chance to be your best and to experience all that you can? Or are you living a small life? Paul was gingerly telling them that they were living too small for their inherent business in God. Paul makes an urgent and heartfelt appeal to them. In return for opening his heart to them, he pleads that they will open theirs to him. In medical term, and we have some physicians here, I'm not going to try to step into their profession and pretend like I know more than they know. In medical terms, an enlarged heart is a dangerous liability. In spiritual terms, an enlarged heart is a productive asset. Paul doesn't bludgeon them with heavy-handed ecclesiastical powers, but speaks to them as a friend and as a father. The reference to them as children is not a rebuke, as if Paul is saying that they are acting childishly. Rather, these believers are his children, and the faith Paul led them to Christ. He was the instrument to their spiritual growth. This is an affirmation of intimacy, not indignation. He says, oh, Christians, wind your hearts to us. You are not restricted by us. We are not the problem. You are restricted by yourselves and your own affections. If you really want to experience the richness of love, then love back when you are loved. And this is one of the most important lessons we can ever learn in life. Love must respond when you are loved. What do you do? Do you love back or do you say, what a wonderful feeling? I hope they will keep that up. Do you expect it to come to you without a reciprocal response from you? No, that is impossible. Love must respond. We must return the love we receive. The Corinthians had begun to squeeze Paul out of their affections. He is asking for a fair exchange as his beloved children. You also make room. And sometimes, even as the preacher and the pastor, I try to love people, and some people just don't give anything back. Or we'll try to love uh, members here in this church, and they won't receive the love. All we can do, the fellowship and the love. But people say, I'm okay. I'm self-contained. I don't need all this. Yes, you do. God created us for fellowship, and he created us to love one another. Stop living so selfishly to yourself. And I know some of you are asking, and I want to end today with a practical question. How do you make room in your heart? How do you enlarge your affections? You hear married couples saying the flame is gone. I just don't think I can love him or her anymore. Or have you Hurt someone who has been so hurt so badly, so deeply that they could never love, never open themselves up. Or is there someone in your life, maybe someone in the church or your family, maybe someone in the community that you find difficult to love? Can anybody think of anybody? Now, for real, I don't, don't start calling names, but I'm just saying. <laughs> but the Bible says we have to love them, but it doesn't mean we have to like them, right? This is a imperative. This is a command. Make room in your heart, in your affections. How this is authentic Christianity. You got to open up. You got to enlarge your heart. But how do, can we do this? Or can we do it? Can we obey a command to feel differently about somebody? That's, that's, that's deep. But the biblical answer is yes. By the transforming power of God and the help of his spirit, we can obey his command. I asked one young lady one time, how could she love and forgive her adopted mother who treated her so badly? And her answer blew me away and she said, I said, how can you do that when she went over the litany of things that that mother had done to her? And she said, I just follow the command. I just follow the command. And the command says to love. That takes me out of it, and I follow the command. 
But the first thing I would say to you, how can you enlarge your heart? Because I believe somebody this morning needs to enlarge their heart. First, cut off all inappropriate affections. Just two things, recipes. Cut off all inappropriate affections. In the next verses of the text, we find that there are inappropriate affections going on in other directions. The Corinthians are enamored with the false prophets, apostles. They don't have room for Paul in their hearts because he has been squeezed out by another. They have given their affections to others, to false apostles, to a false gospel. That is often the case when love grows cold. The affections have been channeled in a different direction, an inappropriate direction. Something else is competing for your heart. I want to tell somebody this morning, stop giving your heart to another. You're cheating yourself. You are constricting your affections. Cut off all inappropriate affections. The lust of the flesh, the world, work, money, you name it. Something else has your affection. And that's why you squeezed out the love of God in your heart like they had squeezed out the love of God to Paul. So he says, cut off all inappropriate affections. And secondly, lastly, drinking God's love. But how can our hearts be enlarged? Well, Psalm 119.32 says, it, I will run in the way of your commandments when you enlarge my heart. It is God who enlarges the heart. 1 John 4.19 says, we love because he first loved us. Our love is a response to being perfectly loved. We love because he first loved us. Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also love one another. We forgive because we have been forgiven. We are kind and tenderhearted to others because God has abundantly been kind and tenderhearted to us when we didn't deserve it. Christ loved us and gave himself for us. All of our affections flow out of his love that we have experienced. That's where the love comes from that we are to return to others, which makes our Christianity authentic. I don't know about you, but I want to be real. I want to keep it real. And one way to keep it real and be an authentic Christian is to love. For love is a, a two-way street. I thought about there was an old song, I found love on a two-way street. <laughs> I just didn't go to the second part of the verse, then it said, because I lost it. <laughs> <laughs> and I struggled last night how I'm going to put this together in the test. And so <laughs> I couldn't see how I was going to wrap this all that together in the test. <laughs> So what I just want you to know, she found, whoever found uh, love on a two-way street, because love is two-way. I said it because it grieved my heart. There are some people I want to love, but they won't allow you to love them. I've seen some people who are so self-contained and who are so hurt and bruised and battered, they won't return the love, but I'm gonna keep on trying to love people who don't even want to be loved because love, people don't know, it is more blessed to give than to receive, it is more, it is more important to give back. To love, and when people wanna give you an opportunity to love, when I first came here, I know I tried to love some of the members when I first came here and said, let me come to your house and give communion. They said, I don't want, need you to come. I'm trying to love you and extend the sacraments of God to you, but they didn't want the love. Never be a part of the body of Christ if you don't open up to someone. Don't let me go calling folks and say, what was their life about? I, the pastor needs to know you. I want to love the members of this congregation. Surely I want to serve another five to 10 years, but I only want to serve it if I know the care partners. 
I'm not interested in your pedigree, where you work, or what car you drive. I need to know the members because I have been called to shepherd your souls. Am I right about it? And you're called to love and to open up yourself to be loved. There are some family members who want to get closer to you. There are some co-workers and members of the church who want to know you. So we're called as Christians to be authentic, open ourselves. Paul says, open your mouth. We've opened our mouth and we've opened up our hearts. It's all right. Don't ask the doctors. I'm talking about, you're hearing it from the spiritual doctor. Don't ask Dr. Kenshin. Don't ask Dr. Pat Treadwell and uh, Dr. Austin, all these other doctors in here. Ask the doctor with the PhD. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's all right to enlarge your heart. <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be good. It'll be spiritually productive. Now, if something happened to you physically, I, I send them to you. Let us pray. Now, Marlon, get him crank up, crank up some keys here. As we prepare to close, as a part of our silent meditation, now I want you to, as a musician to play softly, to reflect and think about in what ways can you open up your heart and ask God to help you respond with open mouth and a heart to those who have reached out to you in love. Now let us continue in our celebration of worship as we prepare to close in our offering for God loves what? And I know you're cheerful about the opportunity to give. This is the most exciting part of the worship. It's not only that you receive, but you can give. Amen. Amen. And with your offering in hand, I repeat this prayer together. Blessed one, you offer a redemptive inheritance, sometimes beyond our imagination. You graciously restore each of us with your wisdom, grace, and goodness, and love. Joyously, we, we, we share these tithes and offerings. As you call us to give, you remind us to place our hopes and dreams in your love and grace. Thank you, God. For giving us your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Now prepare our hearts for the benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the saints above, 
Rest in the Bible with thee henceforth and forevermore. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Greet one another as you depart. <laughs>